What's up guys? Welcome to Forensic Friday where I tell you one true crime case that was solved using forensic science all while doing, that's right, my makeup. Today's video will be featuring the Grandior palette from ColourPop. This it was released last year, but I figured why not? I have it and I haven't used it. So I'd like to do like some sort of glitter eye look maybe. I don't know. All the other products I'm using in this video will be linked in the description below. I am in no way, shape, or form a professional makeup artist, MUA, beauty guru, beauty student, anything like that. I'm just the average girl at home like you playing in makeup and talking about true crime. So if you love true crime and makeup, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of my future episodes. Let's get into today's case. This story takes place in 1992. The Yule family lived in northern California. Dale, the father, was considered to be the patriarch of the family. He was an extremely wealthy businessman. He was very well liked. Um, he was a millionaire pretty much and he became a millionaire by selling airplanes. He would fly the planes over local farms and then he would land them in the farmers farms and he would sell the planes to them and turn around and give them flying lessons which is really really cool i think that's like a great idea now dell and his wife glee had been married for 31 years they were a happily married couple they had two children 24 year old tiffany who was a graduate student she was a graduate in accounting people describe her as a very sweet and friendly and lovable and they had a 21 year old son named dana now, Dana was super duper smart. Um, it is said that at some point he had an IQ of 165, which is wow, like really wow. What happens when you have like too many spots to actually spot conceal? Do you just keep, keep doing at it or what do you do? Dana was a business major at Santa Clara University. After spending the Easter holiday together in their vacation home in Parahara Dunes, I believe that's how you pronounce it, God help me, it's probably not how you, why is this turning white? Dale, Glee, and Tiffany headed back to their home in Fresno, California. I don't know what happened to Dana, I think, I don't know if he stayed behind or if he went, you know, his own way, I'm guessing he's, he went his own way, but he didn't go, he supposedly didn't go back. Two days later, the Yule's housekeeper was trying to get into their home and she noticed that although the doors were locked, the alarm system had been shut off. So that didn't really make sense to her. She thought that was really, really odd and it just didn't fit. She had no idea what horror she was about to experience because inside of the home, she found Dale, Glee, and Tiffany, all dead from gunshot wounds. So the house was completely ransacked. Um, jewelry was missing from the home. Dale's wallet was completely empty. And the police just thought they'd never seen the house this ransacked by a burglar. Like it would have taken a lot of time to ransack the house the way they did. And most burglars are in a hurry. So um, they found Glee laying on her back inside of the den. One of the officers said that he could never forget the way he found Glee laying on the floor on her back, that she had a look of fright on her face. They said that her face was frozen in like shock and fear. The strange thing was there was no sign of forced entry. How does someone get into the house without setting the alarm off, first of all, and then turn off the alarm and lock all of the doors before leaving? Like this person would have had to have a key or some sort of access into the house. They were bringing in their luggage after returning home from the beach house on Sunday night and that is when police say that they were shot. Dana Yule was the lucky survivor in the family. He had been having dinner with his girlfriend the night that they were shot. He was dating a girl named Monica Zent and get this you guys, she was an FBI agent's daughter. They were having dinner about 160 miles away so that gave him a really good alibi and his alibi was FBI agent John Dent 
who was his girlfriend's father. Investigators found an open box of 9mm gun ammunition in the master bedroom. They also found some very unusual microfibers on the victim's bodies. They found like this particular microfiber glowed under fluorescent light. They also found some rubbery type substance that they couldn't really identify but it appeared to them to be rubber. While investigating the death of the Ewell family, police started to theorize that perhaps a business rival or associate or you know someone that was angry with Dale may have been responsible for the murders. Before Dale acquired his business, the company was allegedly involved in some criminal activity. Supposedly, when Dale had taken over the company, the previous owner at that time had become involved with some sort of marijuana smuggling or he was using his business to cover up a marijuana smuggling company. Guys, he was doing something with weed. I mean, back then this was considered, oh my God, such a taboo thing to do. But now it's like, mm, there's weed shops and businesses on every single corner. You can just walk in like a grocery store and get your weed. So, but just so you guys know, it was in 1992. So this was like a huge thing for them. Police also thought that Glee Yule may have been the target because she worked for the CIA at some point in time. Now the CIA did not tell police the whole lot, obviously. They did confirm that Glee had in fact worked for them. Consider Considering the aspects of this case with the CIA's involvement and you know the smuggling of weed and all of these different things that were going on and aspects of the case, police knew that this was going to be a very difficult case to solve. Now it's time to go into the palette, but anyway, back to the story. So police suspected that the Yule family was killed on Sunday night after they arrived back from their vacation. Tiffany and Glee had driven separately, so they arrived home first and was shot first. Dale got home about a half an hour later and whoever had killed Glee and Tiffany still remained in the house. Police could not figure out why the intruder would stay in the home a half an hour after they had already shot the two people that came home and clearly took probably had enough time to take everything that they needed like why would they wait around an additional half an hour as if they were waiting on or counting on Dale to arrive and how would they know that but for whatever reason that's what happened Dale was shot in the back of the head as soon as he entered the house now all three of them were killed with the same nine millimeter weapon basically they were ambushed I mean police describe it as a scene of pure evil investigators found an open box of nine millimeter ammunition in the Yule family's master bedroom they were thinking, could this have been the ammunition that was used to murder the Yule family? The 9mm bullets had been damaged upon impact, but the back of each bullet, which is known as the heel, was intact. So ballistics experts removed the casing of an unfired bullet and compared it to the fired bullets. The experts found that the tool marks were the same. The murder bullets did in fact come from that box of bullets. Police looked at an identification number which is like I believe like a serial number or barcode number on the box of the bullets and they found that the bullets were actually made in 1971. A price sticker on the box revealed that it had been manufactured at a local hardware store. Now when police called the hardware store the owner said that he still had all of his sales receipts and they found the receipt for that ammunition made out to none other than Dale Yule and it was like about 30 years ago that he had bought, purchased those. So this was proof that Dale Yule and his family was killed with his own ammunition. I'm sure he kept it locked away somewhere. So this meant that whoever did murder them had to have known where the ammunition was kept. Police also thought that the bullets looked like they had been fired through more than just the barrel of the gun. So perhaps a silencer or something of some sort because the bullets obviously went through something that marked them. Police were thinking like what kind of burglar would 
come to someone's house with a silencer on a gun. So they started to think that this was maybe like a hit job or something because most burglars are gonna show up with a silencer on the gun. They're not really expecting to run into anyone. They're trying to get into the house and get out without being seen or heard and just take what they need. Whereas a person who is coming into the house to actually harm someone would have a silencer. Let's go in with this really deep dark shade called Jolie. Jolie, Jolie, Jolie. Obviously, someone with keys to the house had come in, disarmed the alarm, and waited for the family to arrive home. They also had to have known where the ammunition that was belonging to the victim, Dale Yule, was at. Obviously, they tried to stage it to look like a robbery, but it was a really bad, it was really bad. It was like a botched robbery. Oh my God, was that a glitter? I hope not. Okay guys, I'm gonna have to be quiet for a second because this needs to immense concentration. Although Dana Yule had a airtight alibi, police did think it was very suspicious that he got a lawyer. Why would you think you needed to get a lawyer to assist you when they're asking you questions about a burglary and they're asking you questions about your parents and your sister's death. Why would you need to get a lawyer for that? Especially since you have an airtight alibi, you were with your girlfriend, her family, and her father is an FBI agent and vouched for you. Like this is, that was just so weird to them. Like, now Dana Yule did have a motive. He was the beneficiary of his parents' estate. So he would essentially get all of their money and their house and everything like that. So that's kind of a clear motive if you consider that a child would be that way, but like, damn, really? Police say that he would inherit about $8 million. I mean, that's a lot of freaking money. Not enough to kill my family and, you know. But Dana would only get $4 million of that money if his sister was still alive. So that is another motive for him to you know take out his sister police really wasn't even looking at him like that until he decided to get a lawyer then they started looking at him dana also had made some very odd inquiries to the coroner's office um he called them asking them like what exactly was happening with the autopsy what they had found and like what was uh what were they still searching for um then investigators started to look into dana's background and he found that he actually had some plagiarism issues before he had plagiarized a term paper in one of his business classes he actually failed the course they also found that he was a loner he didn't have any real friends or anyone that he hung out with except for one guy now all of a sudden all of these characteristics are coming out about dana and the police is just trying to figure out like who is this guy really? Because on paper, he seems like the perfect son. So in order to get more of his story, they decided to contact his only friend, which was this guy named Daniel that he was roommates with before. And um, Daniel had some pretty interesting things to uh, say. Sorry, the guy's name is Joel, not Daniel. I don't know why I had Daniel in my mind. Well, the first interesting thing that he said when the cops contacted him was, are you gonna arrest me? That's like, I'm a gu I'm guilty cap. You just put the I'm guilty cap on, sir. What are you doing? What are you doing? Some of these criminals are the dumbest ever. I mean, thank God, but they're the dumbest. You're fired. You're fired as a criminal. Don't come back. You're fired, terminated. Police immediately put his ass, I'm sorry, oops. I hope we're all adults here. But police immediately put him under surveillance. While surveillancing him, police found that Joel was not using the telephone in his apartment. He would go to the nearby 
a 7-Eleven convenience store where there was a pay phone and he would make his phone calls from there. He would be looking down at his pocket, which they found out later was a pager. You guys remember those? <laughs> yeah, he had a pager. And um, some of you probably don't even know what that is, but if you remember those, comment down below, thumbs up or something, because I definitely do. An undercover officer decided to position himself near where Joel was speaking on the phone so he could, you know, kind of overhear his conversation. According to phone records, Joel was talking to none other than, you guessed it folks, Dana, Yule. A check of bank records and statements show police that Joel was spending like nobody's business. He was going off girl with the money and he didn't have any sort of job or source of income so police was a little confused like he had to think that the police was gonna catch up to him with that kind of action. They even found that he was taking helicopter lessons which was about $500 an hour. That's right, you guys, I said an hour, and this was in 1992 in Long Beach. Where does a guy who doesn't have a job, no source of income, get that amount of money to spend? They found a check that was for some 5,600 and something dollars for his flight lessons paid directly by Dana. Police now had a direct financial link between Dana Yule and Joel. Police continued to dig and they found that Joel had made a couple of unusual purchases around the time of the murder. He purchased a couple of books but he had them delivered to some guy. The books were about how to make a homemade gun silencer. These lashes <laughs> are not working. A background check revealed that Jack Ponce was a lifelong friend of Joel. Now Jack was the guy who um, accepted the books that Joel had ordered for him about the homemade silencer. They had went to school together. He was a 23 year old law student at that. Records indicated that Jack owned a nine millimeter semi-automatic weapon. Jack tried to tell the police that the gun was purchased to shoot possums in his attic. Okay, Jack. But obviously police were not buying that. But when Jack Ponce was questioned by police, he told them that he had nothing to do with the Yule murders and that his gun was actually stolen. The murder investigation was so complicated and time consuming that by this time, three years had passed. And Dana did not make it any better. He was being very, very pessimistic towards the investigators, calling them all sorts of names, like he was out of pocket and saying like, you'll never finish this investigation. You will never figure it out. Calling them like Bert and Ernie and telling them like, you know, why haven't you solved the case yet? You'll never solve this case. You'll never figure it out. Just being like really pessimistic and kind of like taunting them in a way. He would tell them that the only reason why they had a cop's job was because they couldn't get another job. <laughs> there was a struggle, but I managed to get the eyelashes loan after all. Investigators now had three suspects in the murder of Dale, Tiffany, and Glee. Armed with a search warrant, investigators found a number of interesting items in Joel's apartment, including six tennis balls with holes drilled through them. Forensic scientists found that these tennis balls were dyed with very specific dyes that were FDA approved for, you know, children and dogs or pet use because, you know, pets would put the balls in their mouths and, you know, children would play with it. This would create that very particular fluorescent glow. Now the fibers from these tennis balls were consistent with the fibers found on the murder victims. This was proof that the tennis balls were made of the homemade silencers. Jack was arrested at a restaurant that he worked as a bartender. How embarrassing, but then again, you killed someone, so that flies out the window. Joel was arrested at his favorite Taco Bell restaurant, which the police say he ate about three times a day, every single day. I don't know how you're, he was even still alive from eating Taco Bell that much. Dana, however, was nowhere to be found. Joel admitted to nothing. Jack 
however, did not want to face the death penalty, so he agreed to make a plea deal. He agreed to turn evidence against Joel and Dana over to the police in return that he did not face the death penalty. So as we know, initially Jack had said that his gun was stolen. Now he was admitting to selling the weapon to Joel for $500. Just a few days later, Jack says that Joel had returned the gun to him and told him to get rid of it. Jack claims that Joel had admitted to him to murdering the Yule family and revealed to him some pretty gruesome details about how he murdered them. He even told him details about the house, how he got in, like very, very specific details that only someone that was there and murdered them would know. And he revealed all of the sequence of events to, oh, hi, hello there. We have our special investigator here again, Lucy. He revealed all the details and sequences of events that happened that night and which the police had already knew because they did their investigation like what had happened. He just cemented what police and forensic scientists already knew had happened that night. But Jack said he disassembled the gun, threw the parts in dumpsters, and buried the barrel in some vacant lot in Los Angeles somewhere. By some stroke of luck, the barrel just happened to be in that same exact spot years later where Jack left it. They also found that holes had been drilled into the gun's barrel that was consistent with the information in the books that Joel had ordered. Investigators dipped the barrel into a special solution that would remove the um, dirt and all of the rust from off of the barrel. Then they attached it to a rifle and test shot it using the same ammunition they found at the crime scene. The test was conclusive. The grooves and lines in the bullets matched. Thanks to forensic science and some good police work, Jack Ponce was given immunity for his testimony. Dana Yule eventually turned himself in and in 1995, he and Joel Rakovich were both convicted of first degree murder. They were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. What do you guys think about this case and my makeup look? Please let me know in the comments down below. If you like videos like these, then check out my last episode. I will leave a link on the screen right here. And as always, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe if you don't want to miss out on any of my future episodes. And I'll see you guys next Friday with another Forensic Friday episode. Bye!